Unibet. Episode 103. Kirk Fury, Head Coach, Team Austria U20. I think the biggest thing coming away is the experience that these players will have moving forward. And they can take that away and hopefully they've learned from it. And then moving forward, if they become pro hockey players or pro at whatever it is that they do in their life, um, that they're able to take those tools moving forward, those experiences, and uh, they're better people for it, and they're better, better colleagues, better teammates for it. Die Tribüne erhebt sich. Und der Hexenkessel kocht. Da bleibt kein Moment, um einmal durchzuatmen. Bring it on. Mit dem Tortender. Abgefälscht. Und die Scheibe im Tor. Aus dem Nichts. Wie schön war das gemacht. Unibet Hockey. O'Clock. Christmas time normally is the time where everything gets a little karma for a lot of people but not for the people that are covering that are playing that are coaching in the second most important annual hockey tournament it's of course the world juniors that are happening in canada starting on the second day after christmas it's going to happen in halifax it's going to happen in moncton and of course team austria is going to be part of that and it Gives me great pleasure to finally have him on. He's been on on the shortlist of the podcast anyways, but as he's the head coach of Team Austria's U20 team that heads to Halifax and, and hopefully stays in the April, it's great to have him on. It's none other than Kirk Fury and Coach Fury. Is so thankful that you're taking the time for Unibet Hockey Clock. Thanks for having me on, Martin. Coach, the people who know you know that your German is excellent and we could have done the conversation in in German anyways but because of the fact that it's an international tournament and that so many people uh, might be curious about things that go on within Team Austria uh, I thought it might be a good idea to record this conversation in English I hope it's okay for you as well yeah, absolutely and I, I think you're uh, being really nice by saying my German is really good but uh, but no I'm absolutely okay okay with it and uh, yeah so looking forward to it Coach, for the very few people who are listening to this podcast, because the U20 has always been, or the, the World Juniors have always been a hot topic the, the last couple of years. But if there's anyone out there who doesn't understand why the World Juniors are so big, how would you explain that to them? And actually something, and actually when you say it to me right now, it sends chills down my spine um, when you ask me a question like that, because... Um, I guess this can this is going to be a bit of a long answer because um, because where it is, um, everybody knows or most people know the magnitude when it's held in North America. Um, the 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 amount of fans that, that will come out to it, um, but it was it was something growing up that, and it still is, and that's kind of by talking to people here, it's actually it's kind of neat to know that it's still the same way. Um, When we woke up on the 26th of, or you, you look forward to it. And I have to say my son is the same way still now on the 26th. When you woke up, um, you watch hockey all day. You, you got ready, you sat on the couch and you watched uh, the world juniors and you, it was, it was such an exciting thing. It was the talk of the town, um, talk of the country for, um, for, you know, for, for the week before, for sure. And, uh, obviously Christmas is, an extremely important time for family and friends. And, and it actually is a, an opportunity for everybody to get together and sit around and uh, really enjoy the company of each other. And, and uh, yeah, the magnitude of it here, uh, especially here in Nova Scotia, um, you know, uh, there's a couple of things for me with the players here is that I, I was really hoping that um, things didn't change so much because it's been a few years since we've been back and, And it absolutely has not changed. And, and the hospitality is one of those things and, and how people embrace it. Um, they, you know, and how, like I said, the hospitality with the people and the guys have been saying to me, like, these people are really nice here. And so, you know, they're willing to give you a ride when you need a ride. If uh, they're, And, you know, they, they really, they look upon every team the same. It's, it doesn't matter uh, your ranking in the world. Um, You know, for instance, we had practice. Uh, we had practice last night, and and you know, there's kids waiting. You know, there's there's kids waiting in the stands. They're you know they're 
they want to touch the guy's gloves coming off. You know, they it's, it's, and this is the part of the tournament too, that I really want the players to experience because over the past two or three years here, everybody knows with COVID, these guys really haven't been able to, you know, the people that the players that have been here and for the players that have never been here, they've never had the opportunity to re- really experience the, the the atmosphere that's going to be in the, in the rinks. So um, it is something that is for sure um, something that this country and I have to say, especially this province here in Nova Scotia embraces. They, the way I, I, I believe, and this is my own opinion, they look at this tournament as the, as the world, like the world cup of soccer for them. You know, they really embrace it. They want to do the best. And, and quite honestly, they, it's a small province here in Canada and they really want to let everybody know that they can do it just as well as anybody else. And so um, it's something that, you know, I'm really looking forward to. And obviously but it goes without saying that the hockey part of it is, is, is the most important to us. We're here to, we're here to not just be here. We're here to, to make some noise and we're here to, uh, we're here to be very present. And that's probably just scratching the surface of, of everything that goes into the world juniors. Now you, you were born and raised in Nova Scotia. Uh, the tournament is, is taking place or, or the, the, the group A uh, plays its games in, in Halifax, Nova Scotia, uh, obviously the same state, but your hometown is four and a half hours away. As of right now, there's camp in uh, a place basically in between your hometown and, and, and Halifax. What does it mean for you as a Nova Scotia guy to be a head coach at this tournament in your home state? emotional question but um yeah it's a dream come true to be quite honest with you um something that i i don't know i don't think you could write a script um first and foremost i'm thankful to the federation i'm thankful to Kotze, um my home club for get, allowing me the opportunity for this um i'm grateful to the players because it's something that you know It's my first experience, you know, with an international, with a with a with the national team. Um, so it's something that, you know, I didn't really, I didn't think about so much. Um, obviously, you get excited, like I told you, as a as a person just getting excited for Austria, just to be a part of the tournament. Um, like I said, it, whether I'm the head coach or not, um, I still would have the feeling of hoping that if these players came that they, they get to experience, like I said, the, the hospitality, the way the province embraces it. Um, but it's definitely something that, um, like you say, we're, we're in Antigonish, Nova Scotia. I'm actually born here, um, in this town. And I was only here for a year, but, um, like you say, it's, it doesn't matter where you are here in this province. Um, everybody kind of knows everybody in a way, or they know somebody who knows every or knows someone else. But um, yeah, it's, it's just something that I don't think you, I don't think you could write it kind of any, any better in a way. Um, but first and foremost, like I said, it's, it is hockey first. Um, we're here to do a job. We're here to, we're here to, um, you know, obviously our, our goal is to win a game. In, the, in our in our in our um, in our pool here or in our group stage, so that's the first first and foremost. And then it's all about the process, and then we'll take care of the rest as it comes. And by saying that, you would write U20 or World Juniors history, Austrian World Juniors history, if you were able to indeed pull out a game because it's never happened before. And Team Austria indeed got close last time around against Switzerland, but that's uh, for, for another time. Obviously, the attention, the tournament's getting in Canada is incredible. This this tiny little podcast tries to, to help raise awareness about the tournament, that it is happening. There are some broadcasts, if I'm uh, informed correctly, again, on on Austria's uh, main uh, or, or public... Uh, Uh, public TV again, but in general, the attention the tournament could be getting in Austria, in my estimation, could be bigger. Is this is it a sentiment that you share as well, or is it already there where you want to see it? I I have to pro- I have to agree with you, and I think the biggest reason though is because 
have the magnitude of it here. Um, I think that it, it would be, you know, it would be great if it, it if it was, you know, you would love to have it the same way as it is here in, in Canada, the way, you know, where it's nationally televised every single game and whatnot. Um, not just, you know, not just the one game or something like that with Austria and stuff and stuff like that, but, but it's a work in progress. Um, I think that, I think that the, the attention um, that it, that it need that it needs to garner um, is something that needs to be built. Um, and we, we, as you know, uh, a team here, I think we can do our part in trying to do that. Um, and so that's our goal, obviously, is because we're constantly trying to build Austrian ice hockey. We're trying to put it on the map on a more consistent basis. I think obviously uh, being here for the last three years, you know, there's some, there's, there's obviously a lot of not so good things from COVID, but, um, you know, it's, it's allowed this team to be in here for, for the third consecutive time, which is a given an opportunity to kids that would maybe, maybe hopefully we'd like to believe that that we would have been here. Um, uh, but, but it doesn't happen three times in, in, uh, two years either. So that's kind of, but like you say, it's, it would be great for sure to, to garner more attention. Um, but that also comes with success. And that's just the way it is. When you have success, people want to be a part of it. Um, so we're going to do our best and we'll do our part here uh, in Nova Scotia to be able to try to, to try to contribute to, uh, to try to contribute to being able to be more present and, and more on the map. And then again, no one would have believed that it would be Austria's first, fourth goal, pardon me, at the April World Juniors when they finally got promoted back in 2019 in, in Belarus. But with COVID and, and some other stuff that's been going on on a, on a grander political uh, scale, it is possible for Austria to, to be there uh, a fourth time, play itself on, onto national television and and be be part of the the 10 best countries in in the world as regards uh junior hockey when we talk about you personally and you've already alluded to it being very emotional for you how did you or when did you find out that you were considered being the head coach or uh when you when you found out that you were indeed going to halifax as the world juniors or the u20 head coach for austria Yeah, I believe it was, to be quite honest with you, the exact day, uh, but I believe it was in August. Um, and I was given a phone call and asked if I'd be interested in uh, interested in taking on the job. And for me, it was obviously a no-brainer. Um, uh, I've always wanted to potentially work, um, you know, in international ice hockey to have that opportunity. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, obviously you have to go through the proper channels to make sure that it can happen and whatnot. Um, obviously with our team in the Alps Hockey League, it, it gives me an opportunity because um, we have such a long break, which is unfortunate for our other players and whatnot, but it is something that we have to deal with every year because we're not quite sure how many players we'll have between our first team and our players leaving for the, for the world juniors. So um, yeah, it was, it was uh, something that I was caught off guard to be quite honest with you. I wasn't expecting it. Um, and so, but with that being said, it was something that I was extremely honored, thankful and proud to be, uh, to be asked to do. So, um, yeah, I believe it was in, and sorry if I'm, if I'm, uh, you know, not, not knowing the exact date, but I think I almost fell off my chair. So I was a little bit, the date was something that, uh, I believe it was in August. To be quite honest with you. I remember when the news came out and I thought, hmm, not a bad choice. And and I, I talked to a lot of people in and around the Federation and everyone was very much looking forward to, to having you coach the team, having you bring the team over uh, over to Canada. So obviously some some high expectations, but some, some well-deserved ones. Um, what's always interesting when you get some some kind of life changing or life altering news. What was the, the first phone call or the first 
text? Who, whom did you try to get in contact with? Family, friends, coaches? Who was it? Um, I think to be quite honest with you, I think the per first person I had first, I had to digest it. And that was the first thing um, I had to kind of, and I think the first person I, I tried to get in contact with was uh, Oliver Poloni. <laughs> so um, obviously I have to, I have to make sure that, um, you know, respecting the club and whatnot, I want him to know, um, you know, because it's a small world. And if, you know, if, when people ask and whatnot, that maybe, you know, it might get, I want to make sure that the club knew, knew first that I was, I was offered this. And so say that I would say another important person, um, obviously family is really important. Um, my wife was somebody that, that I obviously consulted with because it's over Christmas. Um, so you know, that was a, that was without hesitation. It was, if the opportunity was there, yes. And then my brother was somebody else. So, reached out to because he's been a very um obviously everybody's parents are really important in their in their journey along along the way but my brother's a big part of it too so he was somebody i reached out to goals kind about we're going to talk about the the journey especially the one as a coach and a head coach in in a bit but uh the the one thing and it obviously honors you to to call the the gm of your team first but uh it's something completely new coaching a national team and I, i can just imagine it's it's incredibly difficult to to work oneself or, or to, to to get an overview of, of of the tasks at hand how did you try to come up with with the roadmap and and what were kind of the the first steps that you had to take as head coach of austria's u20 team yeah i think it was a bit overwhelming to start because it was a new journey and so um I, to be quite honest with you, I tried to stick to the process that we stick to with, with our club here. Um, the biggest difference was really getting to know the players that are available. Um, I think I know most of the kids. I know most of the players just from the Alps Hockey League and whatnot. Um, but the big thing, too, was was getting to know some of these kids, these players personally. Um, you know, so giving them a phone call, uh, some of the kids that... that um, so, for instance, yeah, just giving a phone call to some of these players to get them know get to know them a little bit. Um, it's quite different than meeting them personally. Um, so that was that was one of the first things the first things I did. And then I was trying to get a trying to get um, a process in place in terms of, like you said, a roadmap. Uh, for first and foremost, was that about November camp. Um, and to be quite honest with you, it's when you have your own club team. My another big priority for me that is that I wasn't being spread too thin or trying not to be. I, I think I think it goes without saying that you are going to be spread a little bit thin, but I really didn't want to take away the focus also of of my uh, from our team in Klagenfurt um, in the Alps League. So that was that was for sure a challenge. But um, with David Fisher and, and Christoph Brenner and Klagenfurt um, had really good support from those guys and. And so um, the biggest thing, though, is that it's all about a process here. Um, everybody has a goal, but I'm, I'm really, uh, I really believe that you have to stick to the process, uh, the day-to-day, -day, and then I believe that the results really take care of themselves. And that's kind of what we try to instill in our players. Um, and that was the other thing. It was trying to, trying to identify what it was that we wanted to not only have our end goal, the message that we wanted to bring to the players. So that was another big part of, of um, trying to organize and, and trying to put, put into place something that, that was going to be able to resonate with the, with the players. You were already talking about the support that you got in Klagenfurt from David Fischer, from Christoph Bantner, but you also had the task of, of creating a team that supports you uh, during the tournament. And it's an, an interesting a uh, group of assistants that you did you chose it's Nate Casimiro some some still know him as a player for uh Klagenfurt's Alps team he was an assistant uh coach for Klagenfurt's Alps team um with you it's Matthias Lange and Lukas Schluderbacher two former goaltenders but only one has the official quote unquote goaltending coach duties over how Did you come up with with the staff? On paper, it looks incredible. Lots of experience, 
Nate Di, Di Casimiro now with the the Iowa Wild as an assistant coach. Naturally, with with uh, Marco Rossi uh, right now on paper looks incredible. But but what made you decide that this is your staff that that should head with you to Halifax? Well, I think to be quite honest with you, um, and I and when I say this, I think it was a it was a great great idea. Um, I think the, they wanted to keep on the staff as much as possible with the experience, and so um, Matthias and 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 uh, Lucas were were here already, which uh, again, great people, um, uh, really really good guys to work with, and very knowledgeable. Um, so really happy to have those guys with Nate. I built a relationship with Nate. Um, Nate came to play actually for the Alps team at the end of his career. Uh, and then we had a plan that maybe he would slide into uh, being an assistant coach the following year. And that's what happened. And, and to be quite honest with you, Nate and I um, built a pretty good relationship, a, a friendship. And, and obviously you can have a friendship, but you also have to see uh, about uh, people work ethic and stuff and so Nate is a very eager guy he wants to learn um he wants to you know he, he work is not not an issue so um like I said it was something that I think it was pretty sure I'm pretty sure it was the first thing that popped in my popped in my head um and so it was like I said it, I chose Nate um, Matthias and Lucas uh, were here and I couldn't be happier with the staff. Uh, like I said, we have a really good chemistry. I believe we have a lot of fun, uh, but we also know that we're here to, we're here to accomplish something. So when it's work, it's work. And when, when it's time to chuckle a little bit, we're, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good dynamic. You already talked a little bit or, or hit um, the, the topic of the November camp that you guys had and the tournament and that, that went on in, in St. Paulton. What were the, the takeaways from that tournament? Granted that it's, that it's only a short turnaround up until the, the tournament. There's basically roughly one and a half months to, to draw the right conclusions from, from the tournament. But what, what were the, the main points that you took away from, from St. Paulton? Well, from... First, uh, first and foremost, we tried to bring players that had character and char players that had good attitudes, and and uh, and that went without saying. I think that we can check that box off um, that we got really good kids. Everybody bought in, um, and that was one of our goals is uh, for the camp. And so uh, the second thing, I was really impressed um, with how engaged a lot of players were, um, and when I say a lot, I pretty much me and the whole group. Um, they really, the chemistry was good. Um, they got along. Um, they, you know, they held each other accountable, but in, in a respectful way. Um, and I have to be quite honest from my first experience with the national team, I was, I was very, very happy. I, uh, to be quite honest with you, I didn't know what to expect. I just, like I said, we had, we had main focuses that we wanted to, we wanted to see as a staff. And I have to say, maybe I'm being a bit overzealous, but I think that it was something that that we came away from going, wow, that was that was that was pretty good. So, um, yeah, those were the those were the takeaways from it, and uh, it actually made it made it even better. Looking forward, looking forward to the to the next phase of uh, the next phase of the, the process. We've obviously hit this next phase of the process with camp now in, in Nova Scotia. We're recording this conversation a couple of days prior to, to it seeing the, the, the day of light and, and appearing on, on everybody's podcast feed. And, and then we still got a couple of days up until the tournament starts on the 26th. What are the things that you're now trying to work on as the, the tournament is inching closer? Um, well, we... we <laughs> Actually, we kept the structure fairly similar to November uh, because we have about five guys, I believe it is, that weren't a part of the group um, in November. So the first and foremost is called all the players that called all the players that we excuse me that we didn't bring, and all the players that that we brought that we touched base with the parents and and what we want to do now is to integrate and bring that message from November forward to this part of the part of the process to this phase of uh of the process that that really 
we can get these other, we get the players that weren't here to buy into to our message and, and what we want to accomplish here. Um, uh, another part that's we want to we want to be aggressive, uh, and when I say aggressive, I, I mean that we want to be a team that's that's constantly moving, um, and so that's something that we we really want to get across to the players. So we're pushing them, and I have to quite, I have to be quite honest with you now that this is the second time with most most players. The push in the beginning was to get to know guys a little bit um, to kind of scan the group and and see personalities and whatnot. Now we know them a little bit better. So now the push is going to be there and, and, uh, but in a positive way because it's a short tournament. Um, so that's the biggest thing. And, and to be quite honest with you, I've been in, uh, Europe for 60 or for almost 20 years, sorry. And the ice, the ice sheet, um, the ice sheet is quite a bit smaller here. So, um, it's something that we want to play uh, a style that's fast it's a style that's uh, in your face type of thing. And so that's now even trying to push that message forward because there's less time and space. There's not only less time and space for us, there's less time and space for the opponents. So, um, so that's kind of the message that we're trying to push here now with the group also. It's an interesting group uh, that that you've already talked a little about. Um, it's a, a group of, of returning players. It's a group of, of new players. It's a group uh, of of players or where some players will be under media and scout scrutiny. The one that kind of stands out and that makes each and every available draft list at, at this point is defenseman David Reinbacher. Uh, If the draft happened today, he'd probably be a first-round pick. He's he's gotten lots of attention for his play in, in Switzerland. The the bus with all the scouts probably uh, not not getting any smaller it, when when he's playing in Canada. How do you deal with with him specifically, knowing that that he'll be one player that that everybody has, or every scout has kind of got him on his radar. Well, first and foremost, we're going to support the player um, that if he needs any help with that type of stuff, with that attention and whatnot. But, but as you've said, I've uh, followed David now for obviously um, since I, since I was given the position and, and we, everybody have seen the trajectory of David throughout the year and it's just gotten better and better for him. Uh, but, but I think he's a kid that is, I explain him as from what I know of him so far, he's very humble. He's very, he's a very good kid. And I think he's a kid that just loves to play hockey. Um, and it's kind of his stage when he gets out there. And so I think that's a really uh, good quality that, that players ha a player like him has, um, that he can kind of, um, you know, if you will, turn off the noise a little bit. And yeah, so I think he's a, I think he's a kid that, 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 um, can, can embrace that, these situations. And, and as I said, he's played in the, in the first league in Switzerland now uh, the whole year. So he's playing in front of some pretty big crowds and whatnot and getting enough attention. So I think he's got a bit, some experience uh, with dealing with that type of stuff. When asking you to, to jump onto the pod, I, First of all, knew that that your time was was limited, and there's there's a bus to to be reached. So I'll try to to, to keep this uh, conversation fairly short. Uh, I also wanted to introduce you to uh, a broader hockey audience. I know you're a well known name in and around Klagenfurt, and obviously everybody on the Alps Hockey League level knows you, and all those people who, who saw you play back in the day with with uh, Klagenfurt. But to all those people who are new to Kirk Fury, I thought, well, is there a person who might be able to help me explain the, the journey that you took as a coach and I got a great assist from KLC Press official Hannes Biedermann, who put me in touch with Ryan Foster, well-known former KLC player as well. Uh, he's, he's been successful as a coach, as a head coach. And I asked Ryan Foster to tell me a little bit about the, the evolution of Kirk Fury as a coach. This is what he said. So I've actually known Kirk uh, for quite a long time. Um, the funny thing is that uh, when I left uh, playing Katze in 2007, uh, Kirk came in the following year. We never had a chance to play with each other or play against each other, but 
Um, obviously, when I retired, I made the move back to Klagenfurt. Um, Kirk was still playing at that time. I ended up joining the organization as a, as a junior coach and uh, got to know Kirk during that time. Uh, we became really, really close friends, uh, spent a lot of time together. And um, I know the situation back then was Kirk, uh, after he retired, uh, he took the assistant coaching job uh, with the first team under Doug Mason. Spent a year with the first team as the assistant coach. I believe that Doug uh, had left during the season and the following season, Mike Pellegrimus was brought in and uh, Mike Pellegrimus wanted to bring in his own assistant coach. So um, back at that time, Dieter Kalt was our sport director. Uh, we made the decision to put a team for the first time in the Alps League. Uh, and um, I was going to take over at that point and uh, we we're looking for uh, someone that's... Uh, would would actually uh, be a, be a good hand to help out, and uh, Kirk uh, Kirk's name came up. He was still in the organization. We were trying to maybe find out where he could uh, fit in at that point, and uh, I thought it was a perfect situation. Uh, Kirk and I running the Alps team uh, for the very first year. Kirk has a lot of experience. Um, he was also a defenseman. I was a forward, and uh, it was it was great chemistry. You know, we we took over the first year, uh, spent the year together. Uh, I learned a lot from Kirk, um, and uh, he's 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 a guy that uh, kind of wears his heart on his sleeve. Uh, he's very knowledgeable. Uh, he wants the best for the players. He's always trying to help them out. He's trying to help them out uh, to uh, you know try and you know help them with becoming a professional, especially at that point when we were coaching the uh, the Elves team together. Um, he's a guy that's you can tell right away when he when he talks to the players, he exhibits confidence. So he's the kind of guy that when the when he talks, the players listen to him. And he's he's also a coach that's that's very tactical, um, little small details. Um, it's it was it was great working with him. It's like I said, I learned a lot from him. Uh, I know that. Uh, He's constantly, as a coach, trying to get better. Uh, I think he's done an outstanding job the last years, and I'm, I'm really, really happy for him uh, that he got the chance to uh, to take over the under-20 team. He absolutely deserves it. Uh, he's been in the business now for, for, I would say, a good seven or eight years, and uh, he's starting to make a, a good name for himself. Um, but like I said, he's just a, a really positive influence, uh, especially on the players. I think the players respect him, and uh, he's he's done a great job so far. Big words from a a great coach and, and lots of things in there to to digest. I want to I want to get to the confidence that he that he mentioned that that's almost second second bar none. Is that one of the main traits? Does it have to be one of the main traits uh, a coach has to have? I think personally, first first and foremost, I think those words from Ryan are um, very <laughs> really nice. Um, But Ryan says he learned a lot from me. I learned a lot from Ryan also. Um, and I'm really happy for him. And Ryan's a great person. Um, talks about caring about, about the players and whatnot. He cares about people a lot too. And that's just a quality that he has. And I think in touching on that, um, I just think, I think as a coach, this is just what I would like to be as a coach. I think you need to be first and foremost vulnerable. I think you need to be somebody that, and somebody that cares about people. Um, first and foremost, we can have all the tactics uh, that we want. Um, but if the player doesn't know that you actually care about them, because there's going to be moments that, you know, we all played and there's going to be moments that are going to be frustrating and the coach is going to be, you know, frustrated with the player or, or wanting to get more. But at the same time, they first and foremost need to know that you care about them because if somebody's trying to hold them accountable and, They know that they don't care about them then, or not even know if they feel that, then it's just somebody that's, you know, just somebody that's getting, being all over them. And so um, confidence, I think it's, like I said to you, I think it's the really confidence is built on preparation. I think that that's the biggest thing. And that is something that we try to instill in the players. Like Ryan said about, teaching to be a pro and whatnot and what it takes to be a pro. Uh, it's, it's a process. It takes a while for some people to learn it earlier. Some people learn it later, but um, I think that's the biggest thing about, about the confidence and whatnot. And that's, you know, it's just something that putting it over on to the players is that 
that's and even touching on the U20 here that's uh, we want that for the players we want them to feel we want them to be confident we want them to be confident in themselves there's enough outside noise um that people talk and whatnot but if they if they prepare properly to take care of the process that builds confidence but also as a coaching staff and, and coaches we want to instill in the players a belief and that confidence so um, I think it's just, it has to happen naturally. It has, it has to happen organically. Um, players are not, players are very knowledgeable today. Everybody wants to know the why. And they, so when they ask you that question, they know if it's fake or if it's real. The confidence is so important because if one looks at the group, it's Canada, it's Sweden, it's Czech Republic, it's Germany, and it's Austria. You need to win at the very least one game to have a shot at at staying in in the April. Otherwise, it's it's down to to the relegation or the the playouts. And we all know that that anything can happen in a best of three series there. And and if one just looks at Team Canada of the twenty two players that have been nominated for the World Juniors, twenty have been drafted to the National Hockey League according to the Unibet stats. That's a 90% chance that you encounter uh, an NHL draftee if you're playing against Canada. And, and of course, they're the juggernaut. And the same goes for Sweden, where two-thirds of all their players on the current World Juniors rosters have been drafted. But what kind of motivational tools are you trying to, to use to make players indeed believe that even if it's the slimmest of shots, you still have a shot? I think people are people at the end of the day um, with the way we want to play. And yeah, they have just to touch on that. They have only, I believe I saw they have three kids undrafted on the, on the roster, but two of them are supposed to be one and two this year. So, so it is what it is. It's the elephant in the room that everybody knows. And so we address it, we address it right away. And, and yeah, everybody's going to be, you know, nervous and it's going to be a big crowd and, and, you just address it right away and, and, and it is what it is. And, you know, you, you give, you give the best fight that you can. Um, but at the same time, the message is to build the confidence in the player. And that's what we're talking about with our way here that, that we talk about our group. We talk about us, what we want to accomplish. We talk about the process. We talk about, uh, we don't talk about the end goal, regardless of what the result is. Um, we can't control the result. We can control how we act. We can control what we want to do. Um, but we can't control how Canada is going to play. We can't. And I and I also don't want to. We are going to make adjustments as the tournament goes on. There's no doubt about it. But and when we're talking just about the other, this is the way I was as a player. And I can use this as an example. There was always, I, there was always the player that might come in the room and start talking about the opponent. And this guy and that guy and that guy. And then just takes the focus away from your own group. And so, yeah, we have to do pre-scout. We have to, we have to prepare our players with what they're, what they're going to expect. But at the same time, it's always about us. It's about our group. Um, we can't, we can't control anything outside of our group. What we can control is what we do. And as a coaching staff, again, we want to build belief and self-confidence uh, in our group. And it's not an overnight thing. Uh, like we said, it's a short process. And we want to give our players the best feeling that we possibly can. And we want to stay positive with them. With that being said, that doesn't mean that we're just rah, rah, cheer, cheer. We have to, we're going to hold each other accountable. But like I said, with the group that we had in November and the players that are coming in, I don't think that's something that's going to be, you know, we are going to have ups and downs, but it's our job as a staff. When the boys fall down, you know, we help them get back up, dust off the, or, or yeah, brush off the, the, the dirt and, and keep going forward here. So it's, again, I can't say enough. It's all about, it's all about the Austrian U20 national team. It's not about anybody else. And it is about enjoying the experience, um, embracing the moments, uh, but talking about us the whole time. After I've already quoted the, the Unibet stats, Unibet, of course, has a special offer for all new customers. It's a 400% welcome bonus. Just use the promo code hockey minus bonus while putting in 10 euros into your new account for the first time and receive 40 euros for free. More details in the show notes of the podcast. As always, Unibet by players for players. Got two more questions for you, coach, and then uh, I'll hopefully uh, be, be able to let you go so that you can catch the bus because there is a practice to, to be held. 
everybody should be circling the game against Canada because even though Austria will be a huge underdog, of course, but everybody will be able to see Conor Bedard. Is it going to be Conor Bedard's tournament? Is this the world champ? I mean, he already broke out on on the World Juniors uh, the last time around, but is this uh, the the tournament where he solidifies his his generational player status? Yeah, I think that this is the stage that everybody kind of any kid that comes through this tournament that that has that uh, attention. I think this is where he probably solidifies that. Um, uh, I I have to be quite honest with you. Um, I'm like anybody else. You see the highlights from him and whatnot, but from what the media is talking about here, um, you know they have the 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 pre-draft uh, rankings and whatnot, and he's still consensus number one. So um, I think it's just going to be great for everybody, the fans and whatnot, to to see him and. Uh, and we're going to have to try to we're going to try to contain them as best as we can. So, uh, but again, uh, I think it is I think it is the stage that these kids really really uh, cement themselves in the position that they are. Austria starts the tournament by playing Sweden on December 26th. Just a day later, it's the Czech Republic on the 29th. It's the aforementioned game against Canada on the 30th. It's the game against Germany. And if necessary, there's some relegation play for remaining in the A pool or going down the, the B pool against the last place finisher of Group B. And those relegation games are happening on the 2nd of January the 4th of January, and if necessary, on the 5th of January as well. It's basically 10 days and uh, potentially seven games in there. How are you trying to to, to deal with bodies and minds in, in, in this incredibly tight stretch or for this incredibly tight stretch? I think first and foremost, um, we as a staff, and that being including our doctors, physios, um, we have to manage that really well. This is a this is not something that is for sure uh, any player is, is used to for the most part, uh, but especially European players are not playing that many games in such a short period of time. So we have to keep we have to make sure we're listening to the players, um, we're listening to our staff, um, that we're understanding that that it is a short time and, and our recovery is real done really really well. Um, and the mental mindset, uh, because your mental fatigue will, will set in. And that's something that we're talking about, you know, that we're constantly staying positive, that, that we're, we're talking about the mental mindset moving forward. And I think that if we instill that process, um, I think the results, again, they, they ultimately take care of themselves. So it becomes more like you talked about with, like Ryan said it about tactics and whatnot, but all the all the answers and the questions right now are not really so much about the tactics as they are about the mental mindset and, and just guys taking care of themselves and and us managing it as as a staff as best as possible. Last question, and I don't want to aim at a certain outcome. I just want to want to shoot you straight from the, the the hip, or want you to to shoot straight from the hip. What has to happen for you to to fly home to to Austria? It doesn't matter when to say it's been a good tournament. I think that uh, I think that at the end of the day, um, that the the players and I just talked about tactics that that, that we are paying attention to the details, and then with our identity that uh, we want to play. If we can come away from that saying that we gave it our best and we left it all out there, uh, I know it's a cliche, but if we really, really do that, I think that we can come away and be proud of what we've done. Again, we can't control the results all the time. Um, we can take care of the process, and I believe the process will give you the results that you deserve. Um, but I think that's ultimately what we can do and come away. Again, the elephant in the room, right? Everybody knows that we want to stay up. There, it goes without saying. Um, but I think that's ultimately what we have to do. And and I think that at the end of the day, I think if we do that, I think the biggest thing coming away is the experience that these players will have moving forward. And they can take that away and hopefully they've learned from it 
And then moving forward, if they become pro hockey players or pro at whatever it is that they do in their life, um, that they're able to take those tools moving forward, those experiences, and uh, they're better people for it and they're better, better colleagues, better teammates for it. Couldn't have put it any better. Thank you so much for taking such extensive time. Wish you all the best personally and of course the, the team as well for the World Juniors. I'll be watching hopefully a lot of listeners here on Unibet Hockey O'Clock will tune in. The game start on December 26th. Kirk Fury, it's been a pleasure talking to you. All the best for the tournament. Thanks, Martin. I really appreciate your time. you having me on and uh, yeah, look forward to the next time. Exzellente Unterhaltung mit dem schönsten Sport der Welt. Unibet. Okay, let's go. Cool.